Welcome to our webcast, Industrial Ethernet Part 2, Case Studies. Now I'm happy to introduce today's distinguished speaker. Steve Schnabley, Director of Engineering and IT at Malisco Engineering, has been working at Malisco for more than 16 years. He's leader, designer, and developer of process controls, manufacturing automation and intelligence, and servers and networking in the pharmaceutical, food and beverage, dairy, specialty chemical, and life sciences industries. Most recent projects include implementation of systems using S88 batch control, redundancy, virtualization, and thin client technology in an FDA-regulated industries, uh, upgrades to systems from thick clients to thin clients, Steve is currently working on a plant-wide DCS conversion to a PAC-based control system for a pharmaceutical client with networking for controls and MES. Malisco Engineering provides system integration and other services related to manufacturing automation and validation. The firm, founded in 1994, is headquartered in St. Louis, Missouri with a regional office in Denver, Colorado, serving the Rocky Mountain region, western states, Canada, and Mexico. Malisco Engineering provides system integration and other services related to manufacturing, automation, and validation. I'm Mark T. Hosky, webcast moderator and content manager for Control Engineering since 1994. I will be presenting some industrial Ethernet market trends from two research and consulting firms. And now I'll turn it over to Steve. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for the nice uh, introduction. Today I'm going to talk about some case studies that I have gone uh, come through um, the various different uh, design and in, um, internet or um, Ethernet uh, systems that I've done throughout the years. So I wanted to go through some practical uh, examples and um, kind of go through what I've seen and what what's good and what's bad throughout the uh, throughout the, the presentation. So today's agenda. On the first case study, I'm going to go over some examples of the importance of uh, correct cable inf installation and verification. On the second one, why you should spend time designing your Ethernet infrastructure. Here I'm really going to go over some, some common questions that everybody should ask themselves when they're, they're starting a, a new design and make sure that you know, people aren't, aren't taking shortcuts and, and everything is, is designed properly. The third one, I'm going to go over how to minimize the impact of, of an existing poorly designed uh, network. Uh, here I'm going to go over where you're bringing in a new system into an existing plant that may have a very limited type of uh, installation and, and really go over what you, know, what you can do to, to help minimize any I issues or uh, you know, minimize trouble during startup. And then as, if you have any questions along the way, please uh, feel free to submit them as we go. So on to the first case study. The importance of correct cable installation and verification. Now, the next couple slides, I'm going to show some some uh, interesting pictures, and really, I'm sure a lot of people will will see something similar to this. Some of these are a little bit extreme, but you will definitely uh, get a chuckle. This one here, this was a nice one because it obviously started out nice, and they had you know nice cable uh, organization, and they just kept adding and adding to it before they had a a wall of Ethernet cable. So that was a uh, you know, that's definitely an interesting, uh, interesting way there. But the, the whole point here is, you know, even though you start out with something, you really need to stick with that standard. You really need to stick with that the nice uh, segregation and, and cable structure. You you, you got to make sure you don't don't let things get to a point where they get out of control. And then this one here, this uh, obviously you know started off with a small wireway. You know, there are several uh, guidelines out there for uh, you know how you should. You know how you should populate a wireway, and and when you know when when is it too much? And you know, looking at this, obviously, if you were to troubleshoot that, uh, would be quite interesting, and you know, have a challenge of getting, you know, which cables where and all that. So I'm sure a lot of people have seen something similar like this in, in different manufacturing facilities. And this one here, this is my personal favorite, and I've seen this at, at several places. This is the the poor man's uh, distribution cabinet. And you can see where there's a few switches that are actually suspended by uh, cabling and, and uh, really really hard to troubleshoot this mess. So, you know, what I wanted to go through in this next case study is really, you know, how to avoid this, how to make sure, um, you know, what what, your, what what you put in, cabling structure, infrastructure, and all that is really thought out beforehand. And I'm going to give you an example of a, a project that we worked on um, and, and some, you know, Things that we ran across the way and and how we how we remediated, remediated those and is some lessons learned about those. 
So on this particular project, um, our client decided to, to install the, the new Ethernet cabling using their in-house resources. They have a really good maintenance uh, department that's, that's good for pulling cables, good for pulling wire, doing, doing your standard you know, electrical installations. But we did stress to them you know, the importance of, of knowledgeable installation techniques uh, using a certified installer or, or somebody that is familiar with, with industry standards, and as well as performing cable verifications after installation. Uh, there's various different ways to verify cables. You know, there's the, the inexpensive cable tester, or there's also you know, all the way to the very, very expensive cable certifier. And one thing that, that I will stress, and as we go through this case study, you'll see, is even if you buy the, the inexpensive cable tester, it's, it's well worth the money because it will save you a lot of time, um, you know, any sort of issues you run into with installations. Of course, our client decided to stick with their maintenance people as installers. And the first thing that we saw was, uh, was the installers, or the, the maintenance guys, pulling the CAT6 cables in through conduits using techniques that an, a normal electrician would use for pulling a, a thick conductor cable. And you know, they, were, they were yanking it. There were several tools. And it was, it was something right away that I knew, hey, this is going to cause a problem. And, and we needed to, to head that off as quick as possible. And obviously, this, this installation method caused a, a few issues. Uh, you know, the first thing we saw, we saw kinks in the CAT6 cable. So as, as it was coming through conduits and they were pulling uh, spare, you know, spare length out, you could see where you know, things were kinked up around, where they, they had the pull strings taped up, and uh, some areas where it got caught in, in some bends and things like that. So we saw a lot of kinks. And, and kinks, kinks in, in uh, CAT5, 6, or CAT6 cable or any sort of Ethernet cable, really what it does is it's going to stretch the internal conductors, and it could, also, it could possibly cause the conductor pair twisting to, to get stretched out. And, and that's twisted for a reason. So there's, you know, there's problems there if you start to run into kinks. Or we also saw compression of the cable, which you know, instead of it being kinked, it was just smooshed down. So you know, that was the first thing that we saw. And, and we actually had to go through, and, and as we saw as much as we could, uh, head that off. and, and make sure that if they could repull it, they could repull it. Now, since they did do some of this installation prior to our, us being there, there's obviously things in the conduits that we're not seeing. But this is why it's a good thing to make sure that you know, your, your installer knows exactly how, you know, what they need to do for installing uh, Ethernet cabling and the do's and don'ts. So it's very important there. The next big issue we saw, and this is probably the biggest issue was on this install was we had maintenance personnel and some engineers terminating the RJ45 plugs. Big problem there is we saw uh, cable sheaths cut too long, so the, the CAT6 cable sheath was not underneath the RJ45 plug and crimped down. You know, it was sometimes an inch or half inch to an inch away from the, the end of the plug. So of course, that puts undue stress onto the individual conductors as, as you plug it in and it's laying down. It can cause other issues. You know, you're not really sealing it, so if there's any sort of uh, moisture that gets around it or anything like that could cause a problem. We also saw um, individual conductors cut from when they cut back the sheathing. So if you'd bend, the, bend it, take a look at it, you could see small cuts into the individual conductors. Again, not, not a good thing to do there. And then most importantly, we saw a very in inconsistently crimped connectors. What, what looked good to, to the human eye, everything looked fine. As soon as it was put on a tester, we found that into certain pairs were, were not making full contact. And that really, really caused some problems when we were doing troubleshooting. The next thing is uh, they were running non-shielded network cabling through a, a motor control center uh, close to 40 volt uh, AC and 120 volt AC uh, wiring. And obviously, this is going to cause some electrical, electromagnetic interference, which can result in potential interference with, with Ethernet cabling. And we did see some of that. We saw where things were running there. We would have uh, issues with uh, HMI dropouts. And we also saw um, issues with, with dropouts of, of I.O. within the, uh, um, the PLC. So we first saw this. It was like, OK, we need to look through this. this, this uh, system and we need to actually move what we can. Again, we were, we were somewhat constrained on what we could do, but we did the best we could to make sure that um, that, that newly pulled cable was as far as possible from the 40-volt the AC wiring as, as we could get. 
you know, a lesson from this one would be is if you can during your, your installation, your, your design, your pre-design, make sure that you're not even running into that or if you're going to be running through something like that, you're running shielded Ethernet cable. And we knew, you know, we knew, you know, since a lot of it was going through the MCC, that, that had to be where our problem was. And as soon as we pulled those connections from, you know, that were going to MCC, everything started working. So that was our first, our first clue to make sure that uh, what we had there was, was, had to do with a lot of that, that uh, installation there. So we then started checking each of the individual cables uh, that were pulled, and we found, like I said, a variety of issues, uh, but the biggest one was really the terminations. We, we had to go through and re-terminate several connections. Uh, things were tested with a cable tester. At this time, we didn't have anything more than just a cable tester, but it did at least show us that pairs were not, uh, you know, weren't, weren't connected on both ends, so we knew that we had to cut the connector and we re-terminate it. So, you know, from this thing, that, that's a very, very important uh, thing to remember is, is it, it seems easy to terminate RJ45 connectors, but if you're inexperienced or you don't have the right tools, you're definitely going to run into an issue um, where things look okay, but in reality you have, you have connection issues. So after re-terminating several of the, the uh, connectors, and we checked for whatever cables we could do that were damaged and reroute as much as we could, things came up and communications were solid, and they've been running, running since then. Uh, like I said, the lessons learned from this installation is it really to ensure that whoever's installing it, whether they're certified or not, knows industrial Ethernet network best, best practices. And there's a lot of those out there on the Internet, various different um, uh, societies out there that, that can give you information, or you're even your local, your, your favorite local distributor can help you with that as well. And at a minimum, you know, make sure that you're testing every connection. You know, getting yourself uh, at least an Ethernet cable tester to do it, and then if, if the project can afford it or the client can afford it, uh, or, or, you know, if, if yourself as an integrator uh, can afford it, is getting something that can qualify the cable or even certify it. You know, cable qualifiers and cable certifiers actually will, will keep a record of, of each cable tested. It'll tell you lengths of the cable. It'll tell you if there's crosstalk across the pairs. A lot of information in there, and you know what what the cable can be rated for, what speeds, and all this is saved generally inside of the the verifier and something that can be printed out and then attached as part of the startup record set. So it's a it's definitely worth the investment. Uh, we've we've seen it wor worthwhile in you know all the stuff that I've done as well. Uh, on to case study number two: um, reasons why you should spend time designing your Ethernet infrastructure. And here, in this case study, I'm really going to bring in what, what I found throughout the years that I've been doing network design and, and uh, um, implementation. And it's not really just one particular install that we've done this in, but it was something that, that I thought would be good. Basically, you know, we need, everybody needs to be asking themselves pretty common questions every time you go into a design. And, and that's really what I wanted to get into. The, you know, a lot of these simple questions are, are sometimes overlooked. Um, if you just make sure you spend the correct amount of time designing and specifying your, your infrastructure, you really can save yourself a lot of headaches. Yeah, you know, it really, really is worth the time. And also, you know, it will give you, make sure that you're, you're sizing your network for future growth. You know, one thing you don't want to do is get something in that can just handle exactly the project that you're doing in there and not think about, you know, what about five years from now? What if, what if they add, you know, 20% 20, 20 more I.O. Or, or, you know, 30% more computers, how, how is my network going to handle future growth? So I did come up with common questions that, that I feel that are sometimes overlooked during a network design. And these questions, you know, I've seen uh, some of the guys in my team here sometimes take for granted, not think about. And I've also seen uh, individuals that, that kind of handle their own network in a facility um, ask themselves, or should ask themselves. Okay, so the first one is managed versus unmanaged switches. Why should I care? Layer 3 versus Layer 2 switches. When, when do I need Layer 3? Port settings, auto-negotiate versus hard coding, speed, and duplex. And then cheap consumer grade versus commercial or industrial grade components. Why does it matter? So I'm going to go through these four different 
questions in, in detail and give, give everybody a, a, you know, a good example of why you should be asking these questions every time you, you start a, a basically a new design or something that you're going to add to an existing system. So talk about managed versus unmanaged switches. Unmanaged switches typically do not have any sort of web-based interface to adjust port settings. You know, typically an unmanaged switch is something that's plug and play. You install it. Uh, there's no IP address that you set to it. It basically, you, you plug in your devices and off it goes. Ports are, are all auto-negotiate, so there is no any, anything you can do there. So, you know, some installations, that's fine. If you have a small installation and you have control over it, uh, something that you need to you know, keep budget down, that's fine. But, you know, you really need to, to ask that question whether or not it's something that you need to, uh, to, to look at an unmanaged switch or managed switch. Now, managed switches also give you a lot of uh, advanced switching t technologies. One of the, you know, a couple of the items are spanning tree protocol and IGP, IGMP snooping. Um, obviously, both of these guys are only going to be uh, available in managed switches, and you need to really kind of ask what you're going to do, and we'll go over a little bit what these guys are in a little bit here. So spanning tree protocol. Spanning tree protocol, really, what that's going to do is that's going to provide redundancy um, in the network. You know, when you have uh, multiple cable connections between two switches, what this really gives you is it gives you the ability to um, give you a little bit of redundancy by pulling two separate pairs to each switch. And uh, spanning tree protocol basically allows for only one active path at a time between the two network devices. So that'll prevent any sort of switch loops that would happen if you did this with a with an unmanaged switch, and, but it gives you that you know that that ability to establish redundant links as a backup, and and prevent expensive downtimes. You know, and it's one of those things that you know if, if you had a, a cable cut, you know, and the other cable is routed in a different area, your 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 system is going to pick that up automatically and switch over. So it's it's kind of an automatic thing. So you know that's a big benefit of managed switches. Like I said, that you know it does provide. Uh, any sort of or preventing any sort of loops that are created by by multiple active paths and and during the, the third case study, I'll go through some examples where this would have really saved some time if if the original installation had this. Another thing that managed switches have is they have what's called SNMP and a simple network management protocol. And basically, what that does is it's a protocol that allows different software packages to monitor the the switches of the network uh, from a remote position, you can even tie it in through OPC into an HMI. So the big thing is here, you know, it's going to give you port status, power supply status, uh, temperature of the switch, depending on, on the switch itself, a wealth of information that could come through. And uh, so you have some idea how your switches are performing out in the field, whereas an un unmanaged switch, typically, again, you're not going to know that it's failing until it fails. And then another piece is called quality of service. Quality of service basically prioritizes critical traffic within a managed switch. So whatever you deem as critical traffic, and you can, you can define this in most switches, uh, one that comes to mind most of the time is video. Video is typically a you know, pretty high bandwidth uh, application, and you know, that's, depending on what you're doing, uh, you may want that to be the, you know, the, the overriding uh, factor on there that makes sure that gives first priority to traffic than something else. In our environment, obviously, in industrial um, Ethernet, uh, you know, there's, there's communications between PLCs, so if you define a port or a protocol, that might be something that you want to prioritize as critical traffic. Another ability of, of managed switch, switches is uh, the, the ability to create virtual LANs or VLANs. Basically what a VLAN is, is it allows you to, to logically group devices together, on this, all connected to the same switch, to isolate traffic between these groups. Uh, and you know, the nice thing here is that you might have uh, PLCs and and a group of uh, um, HMIs or upper you know, servers on the same switch. You can actually isolate traffic between these and have a server or, or, or a device that that spans both VLANs, so you can connect to that through there. But if there's any sort of broadcast, say a printer broadcast or DHCP broadcast, you can isolate that sort of traffic. And this is a simple. Uh, Simple diagram of a, a typical VLAN tra uh, network, and you can see this one has three VLANs defined with nine computers. And you, can, and, you know, looking at the color codes, you know, the, the red computers on VLAN one, they're only going to see those three computers. There's, there's, they're not going to even see the other, 
the other ones out there and likewise on the other VLANs. So thinking this question ahead of time before you start doing any sort of implementation of your network can, can drastically help. So you know, if, you're, if you need to segregate network traffic or uh, want to make sure that certain areas aren't affected by certain other areas, this is definitely a question you know, right away that has to, you have to ask yourself, am I going to need VLANs? Well, if I need VLANs, then yes, I'm going to need to manage switch. So that definitely is a, an important part of, of the, uh, the process of starting off a design. And we'll get into layer three versus layer two switches. When do, when do I need layer three? You know, layer two switches, uh, they'll, they'll forward all traffic, especially ARP and DHCP uh, protocols, broadcasts. So if it's, a, you know, if it's a broadcast, everybody connected to that switch is going gonna, is gonna to see that broadcast. Um, sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. And, you know, it's one of those things that uh, if, you, if, you're, if you're concerned about uh, broadcast traffic, hitting devices, if you have motion control or, or critical uh, Ethernet devices on there, you may not want to have that. So that's where a layer three switch would be beneficial because it can contain that broadcast traffic on the local network. Also layer three switches allow for routing between subnets. So you can have your layer three switch talk to two different subnets depending on how the route tables are built within that layer three switch. Of course the downside of layer three switches is because it needs to do all this stuff, there is a decrease of switching performance due to the overhead. Now, what, what you'll see a lot of times is switches, switch manufacturers will, will counteract that by beefing up their, their hardware. So therefore, costs will also rise when you go to a layer three switch to, counter, to counteract those issues. So really, when we start off a design, the first thing we think is, OK, we're going to go in with layer two switches. And, and, if, and if there's a specific installation or if we want to segregate, then we may put a you know, a higher level core layer three switch. We have a single layer three switch, but then your distribution switches, which are close close to the actual devices, will all be layer two. And it's been pretty successful for us. The next part is uh, port settings. You know, auto negotiate versus hard code speed and duplex. Now, this thing, this is a this is a a, a question that really needs to be answered or asked uh, a lot, I would say, because if you do have uh, a mismatch, you will run into some issues. So managed switches are going to give you the ability to, to set network speeds, whether it's 10 megabit, 100 megabit, a gigabit, 10 gigabit, so on and so forth, and port duplex, half or full. So port duplex, if you don't know what that is, if it's set to half, it can only transmit or receive at a, at, at a single time, not, not simultaneous, with, whereas full duplex. And there are some devices, especially some legacy devices out there, that may only run at 10 megabit, half duplex. And of course, there are also some applications out there that will recommend hard coding these settings on the switch to match the hard coded setting on the device. And that's, that's fine, that's all good, but to, to, if, you, if that is something that has to happen, um, really stress that you document that. It's documented on your CAD drawings for what switch port, and even so far as maybe a, a label on the switch itself that says port 5, you know, hard coded 10, 10 megabit half duplex. So in the event that the switch is replaced five years down the road and somebody comes along and sticks a, whole, a brand new switch in there and, you know, of course, everything is going to default to auto-negotiate, you will run into problems. Um, we ran into an, an issue where if, if they do not match on both sides, you will, you'll see speed degradation. You'll see communication slow down. Uh, we, we've had a recent thing where uh, a client of ours had a, an Ethernet or a network connection to the, the internet connected into a certain port and it was extremely slow. It did work, but it was extremely slow compared to, to, a, to a different connection that he had to the internet. Uh, as soon as one of our guys looked into the installation of the switch, he found that that switch port was hard coded, whereas the, the uh, internet modem itself was auto-negotiate. So as soon as he set that switch to auto-negotiate, speeds went right back to where they were. So like I said, it's, it's very important. You will see communication issues, or you may not even have communications at all if the port and device do not match. So on to uh, uh, consumer grade versus commercial or industrial grade components. Why does it matter? You know, a lot of times, you know, people are going to be uh, uh, trying to save a dollar, thinking, OK, I can go to a local big box store and buy um, a, a router or a switch that I, you know, I use at home, and yeah, it works great. But you know, there, there's obviously some downsides to these things. There's going to be 
Um, they don't typically have the robustness. You're going to find that um, power supplies that are used to power the, the, a commercial grade device doesn't, do not have the, the mean time between failure of a commercial grade or an industrial grade. Uh, shielding inside of the, the switch itself is going to be different for consumer grade versus a, a, a industrial grade. Um, and of course, you know, speed, a lot of times you're not going to see the kind of throughput that you would on, a, on an industrial grade or a commercial grade device. Another thing with uh, consumer grade devices such as wireless access points or routers, you know, you're, you're typically not going to have the range or throughput um, or the security features of a, of a commercial grade device. Typical wireless access points that are used in a commercial environment or an industrial environment will give you a lot more authentication uh, uh, settings such as RADIUS, which, which is a type of uh, uh, authentication that actually ties back to a domain controller. So if I, if I log into an access point, instead of all those users being built inside of that access point, it actually goes out to the domain controller and says, hey, is this, this user and password valid? And the domain controller will authenticate that user along with keeping a record of that user um, being logged in. So it's, that's, that's a pretty important uh, feature of, of a, an industrial grade wireless access point. The other thing is, is typically consumer grade devices, you know, you're, they're not going to be managed. You're not going to have the ability to implement VLANs or, you know, any of the other information that I, I talked about earlier. You know, it's on a very small installation, you may get, get away with, with a, you know, a cheaper uh, switch that you could buy, you know, at any sort of real retailer, but um, it, it's, really, it's really not worth the trouble. You're going to run into issues. You're going to run into uh, maintenance issues down the road. So during this, you know, the, these case studies, I should say, on case study number two, several, they kind of, several different questions. You know, there are some lessons learned. You know, you always want to make sure you're following in industry standards. There's several publications out there. There's several things that you can reference on the Internet that will give you, you know, tips on uh, picking the correct switches, picking the correct devices, uh, making sure that, you know, that, that you're, you're building in, into your industrial Ethernet uh, robustness and future growth that you really need to, to think about when you're, when you're designing an Ethernet network. You know, always ask yourself, do I, do I need Layer 3? Don't just automatically say, yep, I'm putting Layer 3 everywhere, because that can be an expensive proposition depending on how, how big your network is, um, you know, what, you know what, what impacts will Layer 3 give me as far as performance, because you will see a little bit of a degradation. Um, and, and again, like I said, the simplicity of Layer 2, if you don't need that, that extra routing ability or, or segregation, most of the times, layer two is going to help you, but you know, always ask yourself if, if you need layer three hardware. And then, like I said, use the right equipment for the job. You know, don't sacrifice robustness for cost savings. That's probably number one, a number one uh, rule that you want to live by. I know lots of people, people's projects are, you know, they're pretty tight. Everybody's trying to look for a way to save a dollar, but really, when it comes to picking network hardware, something that's supposed to run for for years and years, you you don't want to try to go cheap on things like that. And then my most important one is check your port settings because that'll get you every time. And it's and I've seen it throughout my years as as doing this that you know one of the first things I'll do when somebody says hey this is slow or this isn't working the first thing I'll do is I'll get in on both ends of the devices and I'll check and see if they match. And if they don't then that, you know 99% of the times that's going to fix your problem. So check your port settings is very important. So on to case study number three, how to minimize the impact of an existing poorly designed network infrastructure. This particular case study um, kind of follows one of a project that we uh, worked on where it uh, was, was an existing network out there, and really their network was, was very, very rudimentary, and it really was meant to just um, allow the, the maintenance people to get aligned with the PLCs from a central location. So there wasn't a whole lot going on there. there they were standalone HMIs talking maybe to its PLC, but not really anywhere else, so it was very, very standalone-ish. And then they had several other switches throughout, so they could bring it all together and see it back in their in their shop. So, you know, we had to come in with a, a whole new process center and uh, tie into this network. So, we this this case study is going to go over some steps that we uh, we went through while uh, implementing this. So, the next slide here. This is my favorite one again. 
as you can see, the nice, uh, <laughs> the nice switches there. And you know, it, it, this one's kind of a funny one because while we did this project, we we saw something maybe not quite this bad, but you know, there were switches up in the ceilings and things that you know we we didn't see um, right away. And you know, it, it, this will cause a headache. So. When you're installing or upgrading Ethernet infrastructure into an existing plant, you know, you're going to see some not so elegant installations. You know, a lot of stuff, especially in older plants, it just keeps growing and growing and maybe started off with a, a network that was very rudimentary and then next thing you know it got built on and built on. So um, you know, really, it really uh, is worth, worth the time to take, take and go through, those, um, you know, go through those installations. So during our first on-site visit, we did take an inventory of all the switches. We went through and we found all the network devices that we could physically find and inventory all the switches that we could see. Again, um, knowing what we could see based on you know, the ability of, of physically seeing those switches and knowing if they were managed or unmanaged, if the managed switches all had IP so we could ping them. And our, and our client had a, a nice network device list with IP addresses, but they did not have any, any sort of cabling diagrams or any ideas if there was unmanaged switches out there. So we needed to tie our new controls network into this existing process network. The, the system upgrade was, was a pretty large one and we had to access data that was in various different PLCs, that existing PLCs, and also do control to those PLCs. So we need to know that whatever was on there, that, that existing process network was solid before we tied in. So once the plant was down for installation and then the start of our new network was, was uh, you know, being put in place, we went, we went through the existing network and we were able to trace out connections as much as possible. And we did find switches buried up in panels. We found, found things that, you know, way up in there in the corner, there's a small panel and, and eventually we were able to get up to it and open it up. Sure enough, there's an unmanaged switch up there that nobody knew of. And we also found cabling issues. You know, we found, uh, you know, connectors that were bad. We found, again, things that were crimped that, were, that, that happened to get pushed you know, out of a wire way and it was pushed up against something, so there was a crimp that developed through the years. So we began to systematically disconnect the existing cabling to come up with what we, could, what we figured as a rough map of the network and was able to document connections on the existing switches as well as to find those switches out there that were unmanaged. So we replaced the consumer-grade switches with industrial-rated switches. And then we also went through um, our, you know, all the connectors that we reviewed and reinstalled and checked everything with a cable verifier. verifier. So we were able to go and pro you know, provide a, a, a verification printout, if you will, of all the, all the connectors that we, we checked. And we found switch loops that were, were causing an intermittent dropout of PLC to PLC communications. This goes back to that spanning tree protocol. You know, before we replaced switches, when we found these, you know, they were unmanaged, so there wasn't spanning tree protocol, you know, that wasn't enabled. So once we went through that and kind of worked through those issues, um, all that went away. We enabled IGMP snooping. Um, what that does is contain broadcast storms, so that's something that, that's pretty important to do. And then all of our new network drops in the new system were verified with our, our cable tester as well. So by systematically reviewing each of the connection points, we were able to ensure that we had a solid communications path between the existing system and the new process system. You know, this gave us the ability to know for sure that when we were controlling that device out in the field that, that everything would work as intended. Uh, we'd, we wouldn't have to worry about any sort of inter intermittent dropouts and, and it was definitely worth the time spent up front to make sure that you know, the system went in pretty smooth. So, you know, lessons learned, and this is something I tell, make sure I tell all of our guys whenever we deal with an existing network infrastructure. You know, make sure you spend time reviewing the physical installation of hardware. Make sure you can, you can document what's there, uh, go through as much as you can to figure out if there's hidden switches, if there's switches that are not uh, managed so you don't know what they are, and, and just kind of get a feel for what's there. You know, check cabling, check, check the installation. You know, it's very important to make sure, you know, connections are tested especially older connectors that have been there forever. They might have got some liquid into a panel and caused a little bit of corrosion on the connector. So, you know, it's definitely worthwhile to, to check that existing cabling and connections. 
And then, of course, make sure the existing hardware is configured correctly. If you have a managed switch out there that never had the IP set on it, that you know, it was acting just like an unmanaged switch, you know, take the time to set the, the IP address, get it configured, even though it's not part of your, necessarily part of your new installation. Make sure that the existing hardware that you're going to be interfacing to is, is configured correctly. And then, of course, test the network before connecting your new system. Make sure that that network is solid before you even introduce your new components into it, because that's one thing that you don't want to have to fight is something if you don't know if it's on your new network or on the existing network. You know, as a wrap up, you know, these three case studies hopefully will give you an insight of, of some common situations found in the industrial Ethernet world and how to remediate them. Um, you know, there's, there's several standards out there that um, you can follow, and, you know, we've got some referenced here, but there's, you know, like I said, just take time, make sure that, it, that the simple things are, are, are covered, you know, spend your time on uh, selecting the correct device. Don't always go for the, the cheapest device. Make sure what you're doing fits the project, also gives you growth for the future, but don't necessarily go for the highest end. You don't have to put that layer three switch in there unless you know that this is something that you need to, to have into your installation. You know, make sure your port settings are set right. Check your port settings. You know, don't don't assume that that everything's set correctly and everything should be auto negotiate or um, you know the other end that's been sitting there for 15 years is set correctly. If you're going to tie to that existing network, make sure that things are, are configured correctly. Check those old you know those old cables. Make sure things are, are, are set up correctly. So you know that it, if you do that kind of stuff, you're gonna you're gonna eliminate many of the issues found in typical industrial installations. And we got a, a link here to TIA that gives you a lot of the, uh, the standards that I've talked about. Um, you know, there's mice. There's also some cable lengths, and there's there, there's tons of information on this website. So this one's a good one to, to follow. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Mark. He's hey, gonna thanks, talk Steve. About uh, our, yeah, nice job on those case studies and, and weaving in practical advice along the way. Uh, also, I'll note here that the Industrial Ethernet Part 1 webcast on technologies included a, a MICE table. MICE stands for Mechanical, Ingress, Climatic, and Electromagnetic Environmental Categories. And there's a nice table summary uh, in the first Ethernet webcast that's uh, available on the archive. So I'm going to cover um, part one of the, the uh, Ethernet webcast, also included Ethernet research from Control Engineering. In today's uh, slides, I'm going to cover some Ethernet research and commentary from IHS and uh, ARC Advisory Group about uh, routers, switches, pace of adoption, use of Ethernet in motion control applications, and Ethernet use in process industries. According to the report, uh, Industrial Ethernet Infrastructure's Components World 2013 from IHS, standalone routers in the past have been used to interface networks over longer distances, often via the Internet, providing the ability to link systems globally. Layer 3 switches uh, increasingly are being introduced into the market that can perform the same routing functions. To date, managed switches are used more often in the in industrial networking but most have only layer two functionality and, and cannot be used for routing. Um, John Morse, a senior automation analyst with IHS, explained that the way networks are constructed is changing. Uh, most of the changes are forecast to be at the controller to controller and enterprise levels, particularly where networks are being linked together. These can be right next to uh, each other or on the other side of the world, Morse said. Uh, this figure shows how managed switches are still important in industrial networking, which compares uh, uh, forecast revenues for layer three switches, layer two switches, and standalone routers. This uh, figure two from the same study shows year-on-year -year revenue percentage growth, uh, illustrating far higher growth rate forecast for layer three managed switches compared to that of standalone routers. Several drivers are behind this trend and uh, IHS said, and the cost is the most significant. A uh, typical network will include many elements, including managed and unmanaged switches. By including a layer three switch, however, the network has a gateway to wide area networks, including the uh, internet. Such a structure can eliminate the need for a separate router. IHS said most suppliers of industrial ethernet routers 
uh, do expect to continue to supply many routers in modern industrial networks for the foreseeable future, however. Uh, the graph shows a decline in growth, not an overall decline. The world market for industrial Ethernet switches and field bus technologies, 2013 edition from IHS, suggests that within 10 to 15 years, industrial Ethernet will be the dominant network technology in industrial environments, and almost all components will offer Ethernet connectivity as standard. Field bus protocols accounted for 75% of new industrial automation component network connections in 2011, IHS said. This is projected to fall to 69% in 2016. New network connections using field bus protocols are still way ahead of that of Ethernet, yet the growth of Ethernet connections is expected to be considerably higher through the end of the study period, 2016. The future is still strong for field bus with new connections uh, still increasing year on year. Industrial Ethernet growth will remain higher than that of field bus, according to IHS. The world market for industrial Ethernet and field bus technologies, 2013 edition from IHS, also said that the use of Ethernet with motor drives and motion controllers will more than triple in 2016 from 1.8 million new connected nodes in 2011. IHS analyst Tom Moore said, Ethernet, particularly certain industrial variants, is very well suited to drive motion control applications. The growing number of Ethernet protocols, which are high-speed deterministic and low jitter, means that its application has never been easier. Some of the most suited protocols are forecast annual growth rates exceeding 30% to uh, 2016. Industrial Ethernet nodes and process industries are projected to rise to 8.7 million units in 2016, up 96% from 4.4 million in 2011, IHS said. The world market for industrial Ethernet and field best technologies uh, 2013 edition is the source for this information. Ethernet nodes and process industries are set to nearly double from 2011 to 2016 as the technology increasingly challenges uh, field bus for leadership in the industrial networking market, according to IHS. With this growth, industrial Ethernet will account for 45% of network nodes connected in process industries in 2016, up from 39% in 2011. Such growth will come at the expense of field bus, anticipated to expand at the rate of 51% during the same five-year period. Ethernet switches, driven by discrete automation, will get a boost from increased use in the process and infrastructure applications, according to ARC Advisory Group in its May 6, 2013 Industrial Ethernet Switches Study. Some key points from that report, industrial Ethernet differs from commercial switches. As Steve mentioned, uh, industrial Ethernet has ruggedized enclosures, high IP ratings, uh, mounting and connector uh, types that are rugged, uh, ability to withstand temperature ranges, redundant components, and conformance to industrial infrastructure standards, among others. Infernet, uh, infrastructure applications include smart grid and intelligent rail. Uh, the mix of form factors, point counts, port speeds, media types, and other device characteristics continue to expand. Also, the availability of switches that meet various industry-specific standards further enhances Ethernet's suitability in infrastructure applications. Summarizing this Ethernet research from other organizations, here are some of the most important parts, uh, points in my opinion. IHS commented the, on the decline in growth of standalone industrial routers as use of managed switches grows steadily over the next five years. IHS believes that within 10 or 15 years, industrial Ethernet will be the dominant networking technology in industrial environments, and almost all components will offer Ethernet connectivity as standard. Use of an Ethernet as an industrial communication technology and motion control will more than triple by 2016, IHS said. Industrial Ethernet nodes and process industries are projected to rise to 8.7 million units in 2016, up 96% from uh, 2011 levels, according to IHS, and industrial Ethernet switches driven by uh, discrete automation traditionally 
will get a boost from increased use in process and infrastructure applications, according to ARC Advisory Group. All right, we're done with our formal presentations, and this is the part of the webcast where we take your questions. So stay with us, even if you're watching the archive, because the Q&A is very educational as well. Type your questions for today's presenters in the Ask a Question box on your screen. We'll get to as many questions as we can until the top of the hour. Uh, questions will be answered verbally during the Q&A session. Within a few days, this presentation and the Q&A session will be available for on-demand viewing. If you're registered, uh, we will send you an email when it's ready. You can also access the webcast via the Control Engineering homepage. Now, on to our questions. All right. So, Steve, uh, here's a, a question. How can we justify a plant network without an existing network? And, and that's one of the things that we found in our Ethernet research uh, recently, was that people are looking for case studies and, and justification uh, uh, to authorize uh, projects like this? Sure, no problem. So, I mean, really there's, there's kind of two, two aspects to this. Uh, if you look at more your, your, your higher level HMI to data collection, you know, making sure you have a good robust network really opens up the, the uh, opportunity to gather data, you know, to make sure you can historize data, things like that. Things are accessible from various different PLCs that if you didn't have an industrial Ethernet network or, or a plant network in, in house, you would not be able to get that data. We've saw, you know, we've dealt with a lot of clients where, uh, you know, they had skids out there that were standalone, but but by tying them into a, a plant-wide network, they're able to gather very valuable information. You know, the other thing is, is you know, more on the I/O network side of things, and I like to segregate those two. But uh, you know, I/O these days with putting I/O on there, it's a lot easier to configure those remote I/O racks on Ethernet, and you know, it's a, it's a quicker quicker protocol and you know it's it's an easier cabling generally to do. So that's you know that's really the two my two big keys to go off of to make sure, you know, to push for uh, you know, a plant wide network. You know, your first, like I said, is making sure that data is out there, especially those skid standalone systems out there. Get that information into the HMI, get that information into a plant wide historian and the people that are going to make the decisions, they're going to see the value of that. Great. So you're really seeing uh, Ethernet uh, communications uh, and more effective uh, transfer of information as an enabler to greater optimization. Correct. Yeah. That once that data is is exposed to data historians or relational databases, uh, you you really can do a lot of data with that. You know, whether it's a web-based dashboard, uh, reports, things like that. Even if you're not doing control, there there's a lot of once you you get those onto the network, there's a lot of lot of efficiency that can be gained with that data. Great. Um, can firewalls be used to separate or isolate business from process networks? You talked a little bit about architecture. Maybe you could talk about how uh, separation or isolation might be handled as a best practice. Um, sure, yeah. I mean, far firewalls definitely could be something that um, that can be used to to isolate your business and, and process networks, and, and also by doing routing. So it depends on what you're going to do, and it really depends. Uh, we know with a firewall, you're really locking down ports, and you're locking down lots of different things there. So it depends on on what kind of uh, information you'd like to go across that that bridge from process to to uh, uh, you know your your commercial network, if you will. So uh, it's one of the things that you have to kind of ask yourself and, and, and evaluate what you're really looking to see. Is it is it just you know web-based reports, things like that, things that you can open up certain firewall ports to allow that data through there? Or you know, is it something that you can accomplish with a router? And, and really, you know, this is not a black and white answer. Something that if, if you have an IT department, obviously you want to get those folks involved as well to ask that question. You know, to me, as, as more of a controls guy, it's, it's always good to get IT involved if, if there is an IT department and get them you know, talking into the conversation so that way they can kind of take some ownership of, of that connection from the business side into the process side because otherwise you're going to end up with resistance and if you try to push something in there, it, it's always something that you know, just doesn't work out. But you know, firewalls definitely can be used. It just depends on your installation. Sure. 
Uh, based on these projects that you cited and other ones, what are some of the pros and cons of different network architectures and hardware to, to best support the network for redundancy, reliability, and predictability? You know, it, again, it, this is a, this is you can go crazy with some of the network infrastructure, and it all depends on what your budget is is doing. Like the Mark talked about, you know, during during my introduction, that the current system I'm working on now is it's a fully redundant network, so we have uh, switches that are stacked together uh, to provide redundancy not only on the switch end, but then uh, the actual infrastructure out to a redundant uh, controllers out into the field. So we have a lot of redundancy, and then we have a redundant ring topology for I.O. We have redundant Ethernet drops to each of the clients out there to all the servers. So this particular client uh, uptime was was paramount, so they they spared no expense to do that. And of course, there is a, a cost that goes with that. So you know, you, it's 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 again talking before you start designing, talking with your client or or IT or or um, your customer, whether even if you're a plant guy, production people. You know, what 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 do you need? Do you need, you know, to, do you need to go into there? And you know, the different network architectures. Uh, you know, obviously, I'm a little more partial to Ethernet because, to me, it's just an easier protocol. It's uh, a lot easier to get that information in there. It's it's pretty pretty uh, widely spread, as Mark was saying, through a lot of the uh, the case or the uh, information there. That you know, it is growing. It's it's becoming more and more prevalent in industry. So um, there are some field bus you know technologies out there that are going to probably be a little bit more. Depending on reliability-wise, you know they're more isolated, if you will, um, if you want to call that an issue with reliability. But as far as redundancy, you know, Ethernet d definitely has a lot of options in, in redundancy. Great, thanks. And one more question for a 10-second answer: uh, When you had that MCC, the Motor Control Center, uh, did shielding help when you re rerouted? Did you put shielding well, in that cable? We didn't in that one, but we have in other installations, and that's definitely would help. Yes, I mean that's something if you're going to do shielding would be a, a key for that one. Great, thanks a lot. So uh, thanks for everybody for the great questions. We'll try to get to the unanswered questions offline and uh, connect it back to the the webcast area. I'd like to close by thanking our great speaker uh, Steve uh, Schnabel for generously sharing his time and expertise with us.